Welcome to the next lecture in our series covering the curriculum for novice anaesthetists working towards the completion of their initial assessment of competencies. In this lecture, we will be looking into post-operative nausea and vomiting. Some of the learning objectives for this lecture include covering the physiology of nausea, risk factors for post-operative nausea and vomiting, um, the APFEL score, which is a risk assessment score for post-operative nausea and vomiting, um, the different classes of commonly used antiemetics, um, and also establishing other work-based place assessments that you can link to this um, IAC in order to maximise your work-based place assessments. The primary aim will be to cover the IAC code C02, which is discuss how the need to minimise post-operative nausea and vomiting influence the conduct of the anaesthetic. Um, and listed below this are some of the additional work-based place assessment and curriculum codes that could quite easily be linked and also covered in this assessment. When filling out this case-based discussion to cover this IAC code, you can see where the code can be inserted um, with where the bottom arrow is and on the top where you can add other competencies uh, that are discussed on the previous slide that can also be linked in with this case-based discussion. Starting with the definition for post-operative nausea and vomiting, it is defined as any nausea, retching or vomiting occurring during the first 24 to 48 hours after surgery. Post-operative nausea and vomiting is often cited as one of the most common causes for patient dissatisfaction after anaesthesia, with an incidence as high as 30% in all post-surgical patients. Aside from the unpleasantness and the obvious negative effect on patient experience, there are a number of other adverse and significant effects that can occur from post-operative nausea and vomiting. These include increased length of stay, both within recovery and within the hospital, an increased risk of bleeding post-surgically from um, the abdominal muscles use in retching, um, and this also increases the risks of an incisional hernia following surgery. Um, any sort of vomiting can increase the risk of aspiration and subsequent pneumonia. Again, the abdominal muscles um, with the retching action can result in suture dehiscence, both in abdominal or upper airway uh, surgical procedures. Both retching and vomiting increase intracranial pressure, which can be significant, particularly in neurosurgical procedures. And if prolonged um, or significant, vomiting can result in esophageal rupture, which is obviously rare but possible. Um, and the loss of fluid and electrolytes can result in significant metabolic derangements, such as metabolic alkalosis. So we can see how important it is um, to minimise post-operative nausea and vomiting for all our patients. Vomiting itself is controlled by the vomiting centre, which is an indiscreet area found in the medulla. The vomiting centre has a number of different inputs, including from the inner ear, which is thought to be involved in nausea and vomiting associated with inner ear infections such as labyrinthitis, from inputs from peripheral pain receptors, which is why uh, nausea and vomiting can be associated with very significant pain, the cortex itself, which is thought to be responsible for nausea and vomiting, when people see something that is particularly emetogenic for them. And finally, the input that is most important for us as anaesthetists, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is found in the area of prostrema on the floor of the fourth ventricle and importantly lies out with the blood brain barrier. The chemoreceptor trigger zone contains a number of receptors for specific neurotransmitters and when stimulated feeds into the vomiting centre to cause nausea and vomiting. The receptors found in this zone include receptors for histamine, dopamine, 
serotonin or 5-HT3, and also drugs such as opioids and volatile anaesthetic agents. Understanding what and how the zone is activated is key to effectively managing post-operative nausea and vomiting, as this is where a lot of the commonly used antiemetics are targeted. And we will further explore this later on in this presentation. It is useful to be aware of some of the risk factors that increase the risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting, as this will allow us to identify patients that are at a particular risk. Some of the patient factors that increase risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting include the female gender, being a non-smoker, obviously previous history of significant post-operative nausea and vomiting or personal history of motion sickness, and often patients in a younger age group. Some anaesthetic factors that increase the risk include the use of opioid drugs either intraoperatively and postoperatively, though it's important to note that significant untreated pain postoperatively can also be emetogenic. Unfortunately, the volatile anaesthetic agents are particularly emetogenic, so use of these intraoperatively increases the risk of postoperative nausea and vomiting. The use of nitrous oxide during your anaesthetic has been shown in some studies to increase the risk of postoperative nausea and vomiting, and also the length of the anaesthetic with longer anaesthetic times, resulting in an increased risk. And some surgical factors that can increase this risk include uh, gynecological surgeries. This in part is due to the fact that it is female gender within these surgeries. Also ENT, particularly inner ear surgery. Ophthalmic procedures such as squint correction, thyroid operations, laparoscopic surgery, and also any operation that is associated with severe pain postoperatively increases the risk of postoperative nausea and vomiting. The APFEL score is a way of trying to predict the chance of a patient having postoperative nausea and vomiting. We can see the risk factors here um, in this list. So female gender, non-smoker, previous history of postoperative nausea and vomiting or motion sickness, and also the use of opioids. So all the things that we know increase the risk. Um, and there's a score out of one for each of these. And then on the right, we can see the um, predicted chance of having postoperative nausea and vomiting based on the score out of four. So this simplified score is quite quick and very easy to calculate for a patient, for example, when you see them in the pre-assessment clinic. So how do we minimise the risk and manage post-operative nausea and vomiting when it does occur in our patients? We've already spoken about identifying the patients that are most at risk, which is the first step. Next, we can consider the avoidance of metagenic drugs. So this could include considering the use of a regional technique as opposed to a general anaesthetic, though we need to note that also neuroaxial, so spinal and epidural anaesthesia, can cause nausea and vomiting. Total intravenous anaesthesia is a option in order to avoid the volatile anaesthetic agents, as we know these are key culprits in causing postoperative nausea and vomiting. We also know that opioids greatly increase the risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting, so avoiding the use of these by using a multimodal analgesic strategy. May be appropriate in patients who are at a high risk. And lastly, we have our pharmacological interventions, so drugs that we can use both in the prevention and treatment of postoperative nausea and vomiting, and we'll discuss these in the subsequent slides. We can classify antiemetics based on their mechanism of action. Most of the commonly used agents act to antagonise the emetogenic neurotransmitters that act on the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And these include serotonin or 5-HT3 antagonists, antihistamines, 
anticholinergics, which antagonize the action of acetylcholine, dopamine antagonists, and also we have other drugs that can be classified into a further group, such as steroids. Serotonin or 5-HT3 antagonists include one of the most commonly used medication in the prevention and treatment of postoperative nausea and vomiting, ondansetron. This is given at a dose of 4 mg intravenously at induction of anaesthesia, um, and it can then be subsequently given kind of 8 hourly um, for the treatment of uh, nausea and vomiting following an operation. It is generally well tolerated, but some of the key side effects to be aware about include headache, constipation, uh, the potential to trigger serotonin syndrome, and prolonged QT interval, which could progress to torsin de poids in patients who already have a prolonged QT interval. Other less commonly used medications in this classification include granazotron, polynosotron, and dolazotron. Antihistamines exert their antiemetic effect through blocking the action of histamine at the chemoreceptor trigger zone. The most commonly used medication in this class is cyclozine. Though this is the main way that cyclozine works, it also has some anticholinergic activity, meaning that it blocks the action of acetylcholine at the chemoreceptor trigger zone, thus adding to its antiemetic effect. It is given in a dose of 50 milligrams for an adult, POIV or IM, and it does have some side effects that include anti-muscarinic side effects, so tachycardia, dry eyes, dry mouth, blurred vision, and can produce some degree of sedation, particularly in the elderly. Diphenhydramine is another antihistamine that can be used in the treatment of postoperative nausea and vomiting, but is not as commonly used as cyclozine. The drug hyacine can be used in the management of postoperative nausea and vomiting, and it comes under the anticholinergic class of medications, which does, as it says on the tin, so is antagonizes the effect of acetylcholine. Um, in order to help prevent sensations of nausea and vomiting. Additionally, hyacine also decreases muscle tone and secretions through its anticholinergic actions, so can also help with kind of gut and bowel spasms. The dose of hyacine in an adult is 20 milligrams intravenously, though it can also be given IM subcut and transdermally in a patch. Again, as with cyclozine, the side effects are predominantly anticholinergic or anti-muscarinic. Uh, so this includes decreased respiratory secretions, tachycardia, sedation, and also dry eyes, dry mouth, and constipation. The neurotransmitter dopamine acting at the chemoreceptor trigger zone is known to be highly emetogenic. Therefore, the dopamine, or D2, receptor is another target that antiemetics can act on. The most commonly used antiemetic in this classification is the drug metoclopramide. Um, though metoclopramide does act as an antagonist at also histamine and serotonin receptors, which are additive to its actions. It is given in a dose of 10 milligrams, either IV, IM, or orally, um, though we need to bear in mind that its onset of action depends on its route of administration, so it's much quicker for its intravenous administration, acting in, in around 1 to 3 minutes, whereas orally this is much slower, around 30 to 60 minutes. The side effects of metoclopramide include increased gastric motility, which is actually of benefit when we can use metoclopramide in gastric disorders such as gastric stasis, um, or to increase gut motility um, in, for example, paralytic ileus. Through its antidopaminergic action, it can also cause hyperprolactinemia 
and extra pyramidal side effects, which normally occur in around one out of every 500 patients um, and include acute dystonic reactions. It's important to note that these are more common in children and also in young adults and can be treated with procyclidine. Other antiemetics in this class include prochlorperazine, droperidol and domperidone. Some other drugs that are commonly used in the prevention and treatment of post-operative nausea and vomiting include the steroid dexamethasone, uh, which has been shown to be preventative when given at induction of general anaesthesia. Propofol, which further advocates the use of TIVA, potentially in patients who have really significant history of post-operative nausea and vomiting. And a pripfetant, which is an NK1 receptor antagonist. And the NK1 receptor is another receptor found on the chemoreceptor trigger zone, and through antagonism of this receptor, um, is how a pripfetant and other NK1 receptor antagonists exert their antiemetic effect. So to summarise with some take home messages, as we all know, no drug is without its potential side effects and the risk of these medications needs to be balanced against the risk of the individual patient in developing post-operative nausea and vomiting. This means that low risk patients may require no prophylactic medications uh, with just rescue therapies prescribed for recovery if they do feel nauseous or are actively vomiting. However, high risk patients may require a multimodal approach from the beginning of your anaesthetic. Studies have shown that combination therapy, for example, on Danzatron with dexamethasone, has been more effective and beneficial than just a single therapy alone. And now that we know the physiology of nausea and vomiting, we can see that obviously targeting multiple different receptors uh, will be additive in order to give you a better outcome. And remember, you can always think and discuss with your consultant about whether there is a potential to avoid uh, volatile anaesthetic agents through the use of TIVA um, or potentially avoid a general anaesthetic in a patient who's suffered significantly with post-operative nausea and vomiting before through using a regional technique. Thank you for listening to this IAC teaching presentation. If you do have time, we would really appreciate it if you completed our short survey monkey, which you'll find the link below this video in order that we can keep improving our content. Our references and some further reading are on the next slide.